enjoy our presentation because today this is just the start of a, um, a trial series of talks really and Marshall is the first one to step forward to do a, an open one that anyone we can we'll start inviting more and more people to these things and uh, hopefully get um, some new faces to join in so I'm, I'm excited that Marshall's said he would do this because uh, you know I see a lot of the work that he does in the background with the technical team on the, on the projects and stuff I usually deal with a lot of the educational stuff and um, there's so much going on I4IS now which is brilliant that uh, you know and I'm not up to date with all of it so it's going to be great just to get a catch up from Marshall and uh, having seen your your background Marshall from the bio you sent me I see we crossed over in sort of um, our working sphere in the, in the past so maybe we'll chat on that in the future but I won't say sure. any more I'll let you get cracking we've probably got about an hour with you know questions and answers to throw in at the end and but I'm happy to stay on until um, until everyone's start, eyelids start going or something but uh, <laughs> those of you new to I4S I welcome you to the uh, the talks and all the familiar faces it's good to see some of you here online and uh, Marshall over to you Okay, well, I'm going to switch to the second page now, just for a second, uh, because I was asked to. So I'm doing the second talk, which I guess is really the first open talk. And then there's another open talk in about a month. And then I was also asked to talk about Principium, um, which is how I pronounce it at least. And uh, so that's a very good, that's a very good online journal. And uh, so I recommend that. So, with, um, so yeah, so this work just me it's only got my name on it but it's not just me it's it, there's a bunch of people involved all the people on this list and some others maybe that i i hope i haven't forgotten anybody but if i did i apologize and so about three years ago now a lot of us were pleasantly surprised uh and in fact i'm i'm on multiple email lists that deal with astronomical and other such topics and on one of them, people were talking about uh, uh, this new, you know, back then it wasn't called One Eye. It wasn't, it didn't even have an official designation. It had an internal sort of designation. And it seemed like it had a very weird orbit and could it possibly be um, uh, interstellar, uh, hyperbolic orbit. And so I switched over to the minor planet mailing list and sort of sent out a request saying, well, is this interstellar which generated i must say a very large amount of discussion so that's really kind of my role in this process <laughs> i didn't do any of the observations or anything but i did send an email very early on <laughs> you might have seen this picture right uh i would wager serious money or you know a lifetime supply of uh pub drinks that this is not what it looks like um but it does one eye as it came to be called it's uh, officially one eye, let me see if I can get this right, Womamaya, Womamaya, uh, I can't pronounce Hawaiian, and uh, it seems to be very elongated. It seems to maybe have a very low density, or maybe not. It seems to have a lot of odd things about it, but on the really, the worst thing about it was it was only observed for a few months. It was detected, it's a small object, maybe 100 meters, it was detected after perihelion, so it was already moving away from the sun in a fairly rapid clip and we just didn't get a lot of good data for it and that's actually going to be a problem if we ever want to go to it so here is the chart uh it, it came from the north it went quite close to the sun about 0.3 um uh astronomical units and then was bent because it came close to the sun the orbit was bent quite a lot and went back out to the north um, and so it actually came reasonably close to the Earth, which is why it was discovered. And it was discovered about the earliest it could have been discovered with the software that was in place at the time. And there's been an interesting change in all of this in the last 10 years or so. What counts so much now is not entirely, well, what kind of telescope you have or how good are your CCDs or CMOS detectors, but what kind of software do you have? For example, satellites cause streaks. So software, so the surveys that look for asteroids have a streak limit. Well, what does that mean? Well, if, if there's a short streak, they think, ah, this is this software thinks this is possibly an asteroid and it flags it for further looking. If, however, the streak is longer than a certain amount, um, 
then it says, ah, oh, this is probably a satellite and it ignores it. Well, Waumea was detected as soon as it became, as soon as its motion relative to the earth, it was moving away from the earth, became slow enough it was down below the streak limit at the time. So one of the things that this means is people go and change their software and they have done that. And so maybe they could detect one sooner. And I think a bunch of people realized that this was a pretty big deal. This was the first actual solid um, asteroid or comet that came from interstellar space. And I should sort of quantify that a little bit. I could have included a plot on that, but I did. Uh, there's a lot of asteroids coming in from the Oort cloud. They're called new comets, sorry, not all the comets coming in from the Oort cloud. They're called new comets or long period comets or things like that. Or Oort cloud comets. They typically have a semi-major axis of around 100,000 AU, which is a, which means they have very, very close energies to the um, uh, to, to infinity. If you when they're back out in infinity, they're moving very slowly. Well, how slowly? Well, about a kilometer a second slower than the escape velocity. So the escape velocity is maybe two kilometers a second. They're moving at maybe one. Something, something like that. So there's been a whole bunch of, I mean, comets have outgassing, they have comas, they have tails that moves them. They go by a lot of times planets like Jupiter and stuff that also perturbs the orbits. It's frequently hard to find, figure out, was this comet actually at a, a velocity and infinity of a half kilometer per second or not back, you know, when it was out, uh, 10,000 AU or whatever. Um, and so there's been a lot of arguments about, is this comet really interstellar or not? And most of them have not been considered, most of the ones that have been candidates have not been considered really interstellar. They've had low velocities and they've been ruled out because of outgassing or because of perturbations or whatever. Um, these, this one, one eye, was solidly interstellar, 26 kilometers a second. There's no question about it that it was an interstellar object. And so it was the first thing we've really actually seen. And I had been working at the time on um, peculiar, on nomadic planets and thinking that they might be a suitable target for interstellar exploration, going to it. And I realized, well, the nomadic planets are gonna be a light year away. That's still a really long distance. Uh, Slava Tervishev's uh, solar gravitational lens, that's a thousand AUs away or more. That's also a really long distance. These things are coming through the solar system. We can get to them. And so that really kind of got me interested. And I think it got a lot of people at I4IS interested and some other people. Uh, so far, it has not gotten the funding agencies that interesting. So we have to see if we can fix that. Um, and so a lot of people thought, well, okay, we've waited 400 years for a good interstellar object. We might have to wait another 400 years. But then almost immediately, it seemed like uh, Gennady, uh, Borisev, who's an amateur, but a professional amateur, you might say, because he works in the, effectively works in the telescope industry, um, found 2i, Borisov. And it, the name difference is because asteroids are named sort of after things, whereas comets are named after the discoverers. That goes back several hundred years, and it's just the way it is. And, you know, there's Halley's Comet, but the first asteroid was Ceres, you know, which wasn't discovered by a guy named Ceres. It was discovered, you know, uh, I forget the guy's name, by an Italian. And uh, so this whole 200 year process, they've been named differently. So it's named after Borisov. And um, it was discovered by the way in the Crimea. So that means it had geopolitical sort of perturbations too. In any case, Borisov is, traveling much faster, it's traveling about 30 kilometers a second at velocity of infinity, and it's not going very, very near the sun, it's going only to about two AU from the sun. And so as you can see, its path is perturbed much less than one eye. One eye is the red one here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it comes in and goes back out. Two eye is coming, the yellow one, it comes in, goes near-ish to the orbit of Mars, about 0.2 AU, but Mars won't be anywhere close to it because uh, it's on the other side of its orbit, and then back out in the south. And since Borisov is a comet, in fact, really, 
from the time Gennady found it, it's had, it showed activity. In fact, even before Gennady found it, it was showing activity. I'll get to that in a second. That means it has a coma. That means you can take pictures of them, which at least look prettier than a dot. Um, and that means you can also do spectral work. And there's been a whole bunch of spectral work that's been done on Borisov. It's still visible, so there's, this is still going on. Most of the big telescopes on the ground and in space have been used for this. The Hubble has been used for it a number of times. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image uh, taken from December, about a year, a little over a year ago, a little under a year ago, rather. Um, and the nucleus, the little spot right in the center of this cloud, has never been seen. All right, so I thought it was useful. I actually prepared this for Wikipedia upon request, which was a new one to me. Um, this is the track of Borisov during its travel through the solar system. So <coughs> it was discovered in the northern sky. It rapidly went south and went through perihelion in the near south when you could still see it from the north. And now it's getting pretty, uh, pretty far down in the south. At the end of the year, it's going to be below the galactic equator, or about as far south as you, you know as it gets, and then it's going to go off to infinity in this little spiral. So these spirals are the parallactic spirals. That's the the effect of the Earth's orbit, and you can see they get smaller and smaller as it moves further and further away. Now, if you look back up here at the top, there are these precurve recovery images. In fact, each cross is an actual measurement, and those come from the Zwicky transient fat facility, uh, ZTF, and from a survey being done by Ye Kwan Z, who at the time was at Caltech, but I think now he's at Louisiana State or somewhere else. Uh, he's moved, uh, gotten a permanent position actually, which is good for him. And he could have discovered Borisov. I mean, it was in his pictures. It was there. So why didn't he discover it? Well, because it was moving too fast. And this, again, wasn't a streak problem, but it was the same sort of thing. His software was looking for things that, looking for dots that moved up to a certain distance from one picture to the next. And this was moving faster than that. So once he got the orbit, in other words, once you got to about November of last year or so, you could then say, ah, I know the orbit. I can go back and predict where it was. And he went, and sure enough, he found it. So now he says he's changed his software. So that won't happen again. Um, but because you have this pre-curve recovery stuff, you see there's a, it went all the way back to 2017. <coughs> this has a fairly long history. In fact, it was being observed almost at the time when um, one eye was being observed. But, and it's going to be observed into 2021, probably not 2022, but certainly into 2021. Um, so it's got a very good orbit and that's good. So we started thinking almost immediately, we being the I4IS team that was sort of assembling itself, how would you get to one of these things? And I did some of the early work on this, and Adam Hibbert has really taken this over and done a phenomenal amount of work here. And I think Andreas has been helping him too. Um, the velocity of infinity of one eye is 26 kilometers a second. So that means that since it's already gone through the solar system, by the time you get to it, it's going to be moving away from the sun about 26 kilometers a second. Voyager 1, which is the fastest spacecraft we have and which did this by doing multiple gravity assists, Voyager 1 is moving at 17 kilometers a second. Voyager 1 could not catch one eye if it was behind it and it's not in the right direction. None of our spacecraft are anywhere near either of these objects. Trust me, we checked. Um, But even if we had a Voyager 1 ready to go and a Titan III rocket ready to send it, it could not catch one eye. Um, so, well, how are you going to be able to get to it? How could you find it? And there's basically two things I think you could do. One is you, you do what, in the, what in the, I've learned in the Navy, they call a stern chase, which is to say you know where the object is and you just chase it. And the other is you wait. You wait and you know, lie and wait for another object to come by, which has come to be called a loiter mission. Um, and that, of course, requires to find another object in a suitable amount of time. So let's, let's talk about these. Um, you need a fair amount of velocity. How are you going to get this velocity? Well, 
One way to do it is to do what's called an overearth maneuver. And overearth maneuvers are one of the few cases in celestial mechanics where nature actually is kind to you and it gives you something. Um, generally in celestial mechanics, you know, it's like you, you think you have a, a, what you need to do something, but you can't because there's this loss you haven't anticipated or something. But in this case, it's an actual benefit. And it's just because velocities add linearly, at least if you're pointing in the same direction, whereas energies go as a square and the energy is the important thing. So you come close to a major body, like the sun, and by close, I mean maybe 10 million kilometers, 7 million kilometers, 5 million kilometers, something like that. You're moving at a few hundred kilometers a second. You do a, you, you have a rocket, you burn the rocket, you get as much velocity as you can out of it, so it's three, four kilometers a second, let's say. And then that adds to the velocity. So maybe you go from 200 kilometers a second to 205 kilometers a second, just to pick numbers. But the important thing is the energy, which you square. And if you're coming through there at nearly zero velocity, nearly zero energy, in other words, you're nearly a hyperbolic orbit. You've, you've, you've just got enough to, you know, to go through there, but that means it would take forever to go out to this comet that you're chasing. You would never actually catch it. Um, that can get you well above the, the escape velocity. So if you're just a little below the escape velocity, which is typical when you're doing gravity assist or whatever to get here, this can get you well above the escape velocity, and then you can get to where you're trying to get to. Um, so I developed this one here, which I was kind of proud of. It's very complicated. You go out to Jupiter, you go do a Jupiter gravity assist, which actually sends you away from the sun a little bit because you need to wait a little bit to get Saturn in the right place. You come in, all this in the plane of the solar system so far, you come in close to the sun to within like 7 million kilometers, where it's quite hot, but we have a solar sail, solar shade now that will take care of this. You do your orbit maneuver, which sends you out to Saturn, which just happens to be in the right place because you waited for it. And then you use Saturn to do a gravity assist to take you out of the plane of the solar system and get to one eye. This is sort of typical of these chemical rocket gravity assists getting to these bodies um, in a stern chase. This, the problem with this mission, it's a cool mission, but you have to launch in March 2022 and you have a launch window of about a month. So if you, and that's it, right? Because the next time you come around the next year, well, you could still use Jupiter, but Saturn's no longer in the right place. And so you can't do it. So, you know, this is now just theoretical because there's no way we could do this. There's no, not a, you know, there's no way we, in 19, and sorry, 2017, you could talk about, well, maybe this, uh, the SLS will be ready early and all like that. Now, there's no rocket that could do this. It's not there. Um, but with an SLS, you could send about, a, you could send a New Horizons probe out there. Now, note that this is, you might say, this is old space exploration. We're not talking here about sending credit cards to, you know, Alpha Centauri or anything like that. We're not talking about sending little tiny spacecraft with, uh, with um, laser propulsion from Earth or anything. Um, we're talking about actual spacecraft that have, you know, substantial sizes like New Horizons that, you know, we're familiar with. One of the reasons for that is, well, New Horizons is flown. In theory, we could build a New Horizon fairly quickly, another one, a new New Horizons. We could build that fairly quickly. Now, in practice, it's never quite that simple. Some parts, you know, get out of stock and all like that. You can't, you know, the old computer you can't buy anymore, so you have to have a new computer, but it's better to have, for this sort of thing, it's better to have a more or less stock spacecraft that you could say, we will fly this spacecraft. At least that was my thinking. Um, so Adam came in, and he's really done phenomenal work on considering all of these things and stuff. And, um, and we started thinking about, well, what kind of missions could we do? And it it boils down to things like, well, what's the velocity required and what kind of body is it too? So we have found so far two um, uh, ISOs, interstellar objects, that are clearly coming from infinity. They're going back to infinity. They're, they're clear, they, they're both on their way out of the solar system. And so we'll have to chase these guys if we want to get to them. We might find some that you know haven't come through yet. We have to do that with 
better telescopes, maybe we can do that. We'll see. Um, if you have the ability to, to have a loiter mission or to launch early or, or you know, before this thing comes through perihelion, potentially the missions can become very fast. <coughs> Instead of the 20 or 30 year missions we were talking about getting to one eye, maybe you could do it in six months or less of flight time. Um, and that may raise this possibility. For example, if Borisov had been in a position to do this, and if we had a suitable spacecraft all prepared to do this, we could think about a sample return. <coughs> Excuse me. You have an aerogel or some other sample collection thing for collecting small amounts of stuff at high velocity. Think of it as like a, a whale, a baleen whale that's mouse. You just can open the mouth and flies through a bunch or swims through a bunch of fish. Well, in this case, the spacecraft opens its mouth, flies through the coma and um, of the of the of the comet and collects material and brings it back to Earth. Now you might think, well, this is not gonna be a lot of material, and you're right, you might get micrograms this way. But nowadays with modern investigation, modern uh, mass spectrometers and the like, you can do a lot with micrograms of material. There was a mission, two missions, Genesis and Stardust, which both collected material like this. And also the Japanese JAXA Hayabusa 1 unintentionally collected, I think a total of a milligram, uh, the collection system didn't work quite right. And so they only so they only got dust that was kicked up as opposed to the actual sample they were trying to get. But 20 years ago, that would have been a waste or considered like useless, but now it's not. Now it's like, oh, here's a little tiny thing that's a micron across. I can actually take, I'm, take that into a mass spectrometer and tell you, you know, how old it is and what where it came from maybe. Um, Now, we have a long history in finding new comets. In fact, new being Oort cloud type comets. In fact, one of the questions I was asked once was, well, how early could we have found a Borisov? And, you know, so I actually looked into that a little bit and concluded that Borisov on its current orbit, we would have found since about 1970 or so, some 70 to 75. Comet Kuhutek was found, for example, when it was dimmer than Borisov is. Um, and so if, it, you know, and it was in the Northern Hemisphere. So my feeling is if you, if you reran the tape, if you could have rerun the tape and sent Borisov through the solar system in the exact same orbit, exact same solar position relative to the sun and to the earth and all like that, if you'd have done that in say 1975, we probably would have found it. Um, if you'd have done that in 1965, we almost certainly would not have found it. Now, but on the other side of that question is, is when could we have known what kind of comet it was? And my answer there was, well, Holly, Edmund Holly, back in the 1600s, if he had, if, if a Borisov type comet had come through and been close enough to the earth that they had gotten a good orbit for it, which is, you know, a matter of, of probably at the time being within a 10th of an AU or so. But if that had happened, um, you know, he would, he had the mathematical tools, thanks to Isaac Newton, to recognize, oh, this is a hyperbolic orbit. He undoubtedly could have done that. And since about 1880 or 70 or 80 or so, the, the analysis of new comets has been good enough, i.e. the observations have been good enough, as opposed to a few of them having good observational data. They basically have all had observational data. So a comet like Borisov has not come through the solar system, at least not and come close to the Earth since about 1880 or so. Um, or a larger version of Borisov, say. You know, one that's a few kilometers across as opposed to you know, half a kilometer. Um, so that's kind of interesting. It says that these things are not that common. And in fact, because we could have detected it back to the 70s and because that's about 50 years ago, my feeling is Borisov is like a once in a century or twice in a century sort of lucky chance. Yes, it happened just after one eye. And yes, one eye is probably a much more common sort of, op, you know, um, much more common occurrence because it's smaller. And generally in, in, in anything with do with space, smaller means more numerous. Um, it, but Borisov, we should have detected for some time, and we haven't. And 
So that says to me, Borisov is a sort of decadal or even century occurrence. We can't count on having another Borisov come through five years from now. We might be lucky. Maybe, and maybe my calculation, my figuring is wrong. That's always possible. But I don't think so. So we described, we have this table here. I hate showing tables, but there you go. Um, that uh, actually Andreas and uh, um, uh, Adam prepared. And so you have the type ones are clearly hyperbolic objects. Type twos are hyperbolic objects where it's not so clear because their velocities at infinity are more like a less than a kilometer a second. And I will get to that in a second. Um, type three are sort of the reverse halo objects, which will wham through here at at least 100 kilometers a second and probably up to 300 kilometers a second. That's so fast that on the one hand, there's no question if you detect it, it's, it's interstellar. Uh, it means it'll be very tough to get to one of these things because they'll go through the solar system 10 times faster. And it means that, um, well, the, the, the stellar density of halo objects, of, ha of halo stars is about 1% of disk stars. So if that applies also to objects, and no one knows, but it seems reasonable to assume that, you have one-tenth of the, um, you have one-tenth of the uh, density, one one percent rather, a hundredth of the density, so whatever the rate of occurrence is, there's going to be 100 times less. And so you probably won't see very many halo objects. And also, by the way, they're fast enough that the current survey is probably would throw them out. The software would. Then you have the material that's captured primordially. Um, there's, you know, the sun in its early days had a, had a protoplanetary disk. It had gas clouds and all like that. It had drag. We know it had drag because that's one of the ways things had ways of planets formed. And so any interstellar objects floating through at that time uh, might have been captured. And you might say, well, why would they be floating through? Well, besides just random chance, <clears throat> the sun was born near other stars. And so we might have pieces of other star planetesimals in our solar system. I think that's actually fairly likely. And that is also, that also applies to the Oort cloud. So you have stuff in the outer solar system. Um, and then you have these, the last two columns here are objects that are kind of weird. The, the retrograde objects and some of these, there are a few other orbits like that. It seems pretty unlikely that anything formed in those orbits. So they were captured. The trouble is in the inner solar system, you have this constant bath or rain, if you would, of Oort clouds coming, Oort cloud objects coming through. And so anyway, anything that could capture an interstellar object could also capture an Oort cloud object. You just can't say, just from the orbit, in my opinion at least, oh, this object is in weird orbit, so it must be interstellar. You no, know, maybe it's interstellar, but maybe it's Oort cloud. And then the last are the sednoids. And the sednoids have these weird orbits in the outer solar system where it's, I mean, generally when you find something in a weird orbit, it means it interacted with something like Jupiter or some other body. There's no other body for them to interact with. So maybe they're there because there was an interaction with a star that was passing through, or maybe a planet that was passing through. And if that's the case, well, they could be interstellar objects. And again, we don't know. That's not proof, but, um, and sednoids are really interesting because they're, they're like 100 IU out there. They're far out there. So Adam and Andreas have gone through a lot of work looking at various possibilities. And here's one I just thought sort of, this is for the retrograde um, Jupiter co-orbital. I will butcher the Hawaiian now. Ka Epako Awea, Awea, which everybody calls BZ509 for some reason. Um, and so the idea here is you come out from the Earth, you go out to Jupiter, you then do a gravity assist at Jupiter, which actually changes the direction of your orbit. So now you went from a prograde orbit to a retrograde orbit which is the orbit that this body has. And so you come around and in about half an orbit later, five years or so, um, you rendezvous with, um, um, sorry, with um, this object at a fairly low velocity. So you could go into orbit or you could even have a lander land on it. So if you could ever say, this is definitely interstellar, this would be very interesting. And by the way, you could get back to Earth by doing another gravity assist for Jupiter. You know, it might take another five or 10 years, but 
there's no reason why you can't do that. So we found lots of possibilities like this. Uh, my feeling is, is almost any object like this you might, um, uh, you might have out there, we could probably get to, given money. And of course, that's the issue. And so our, they prepared this nice table here, um, which is built on the horizontal axis, delta V requirements, <coughs> and on the vertical axis, mission duration. Generally, you know, in, in celestial dynamics, orbital dynamics, there's almost always a trade-off of velocity and time. If you're willing to wait longer, you can find things that make it easier to do it with lower velocity. And so, you know, the, the, uh, the limit of that is almost certainly true. If you're willing to wait an infinitely long time, you could probably find some transfer orbit that has infinitely low delta V. So if you only have a meter per second, well, you might have to wait, you know, a million years or something, but you could get there. Uh, we don't have infinite time, and so we pick something in the middle. Um, and so you see these type ones are the IS, uh, the uh, stern chases um, on the far right there. Longest time and long, 20 years and longest duration. Um, I think 20 years is about as long as any funding agency is likely to fund right now. And then some of these other ones are, you know, shorter, but require either, either they're, they're longer and require less velocity or they're shorter. And, um, or like the, the, this rendezvous here, one is, the rendezvous I just showed you is here on the far left. So it's quicker and it requires less velocity because you're not going as far, basically. So how many ISOs should we expect? I'm gonna skim through this one to look at this one. So I like to call this the cap proficiency, but I've realized recently that I need to rename that because it's not about capturing, it's about, it's about netting them, if you think about it. We, want, we will detect ISOs that pass near the sun. Well, how near? Well, it depends on how big they are and how good our telescopes are and so on. But within an AU would be great. Within two or three AUs is essential. And probably if it's much further than five AUs, we'll never see it. So, that says it needs a perihelion of, let's say, 1 AU. Okay. So for any velocity, you could then say the sun's moving along at a certain velocity, and it has a certain velocity. So we're talking about the relative velocity here. For any given velocity, you could then say, well, what's the efficiency of capture? And you get this U-shaped curve. Now, why is it U-shaped? Well, at the, at the left, it's U-shaped because if you have a very low relative velocity to the sun, you will eventually fall into the sun. I mean, if you have absolutely zero relative velocity, at least at this approximation, no matter how far away you are, eventually you're going to fall into the sun. And if you have a little teeny tiny relative velocity, you'll fall near the sun. Um, so there's an infinity, actually, that way. Now, in fact, if you go out far enough, you know, you won't have a really low relative velocity because the galactic tides and other things that change these velocities at the sort of, you know, 100 meter a second level over years. And so it's the infinity is never really going to get to infinite, but it seems pretty clear that if you're talking about one kilometer per second, you're going to have a much higher rate of, you know, of netting these guys than you will for say ones that are moving along with Wamehameha or Borisov velocities, 20 kilometers a second, uh, or 30 kilometers a second. And then in the other direction, it's not that you have a gravitational efficiency, it's just that you're, you're ramming through the interstellar medium faster. So if I'm going along at 100 kilometers a second, um, I mean, everything's reflective, and so you can imagine this, you know, speeding up the solar system. As you start going faster, it's like bugs on your windshield. As you start going faster and faster, you get more and more bugs hitting the windshield. It's not like you're more efficient at capturing them, it's just you're going faster. And so it's kind of curious that the two we've seen are in this, gulch here, this gulch, you know, they're in the least effective part of this capture spectrum. Uh, I, that makes me a little nervous. And you'll see that we, there should be about a factor of 100 better efficiency at, in netting um, or at cloud confusion objects down below a kilometer per second. So I have to wonder if some of those objects that have been dis discarded as maybe not real interstellar objects, in fact, are really interstellar objects. So I kind of regard that as an open area of research right now. Why aren't we seeing lots more smaller objects? Why don't we see, or slower objects rather, why don't we see dozens of slower objects? We're not seeing them, why not? And 
I think that's open right now. So I wanted to say just a few minutes before I close on putting this in a galactic concept. So this is a this is actually from another interstellar mission probe uh, discussion. Uh, McNewtonall uh, and McAdams um, is a log chart. So you see, the, you know, here's the inner solar system and the interstellar medium and Alpha Centauri and the objects we're seeing one eye and two eye and its successors are way off this chart right we're seeing things from way deep in the galaxy well how deep in the galaxy well i've been spending a little time thinking about that and i've just mentioned all of this one of the things that's very interesting here is you find that stars the, the motion of stars is not random they're in the disks they're moving around relative to the sun you might think of it as well it's just like you know dust moat dust motes of dust in the wind or something like that just kind of moving around randomly but they're not they have streams they have you know maybe maybe a better way of thinking of it is more like you know little tiny insects moving around together um and so this is from stars the stars have definite streams there's a factor of 100 or more higher density in the streams than there is in the non-stream regions. And so they, they're, it's not surprising, and they're stars, they're, they're connected to star formation almost certainly, and they're connected to galactic dynamics. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, <clears throat> and I have six, I believe, streams here. And Borisov and Waimeameas really seem like they're connected to two particular streams. Waimeameas is connected to the Pleiades stream, which is a young, no more than 100 million years old stream uh, connected to recent star formation. And Borisov is connected to the Wolf 630 stream, which might be as old as the solar system. It's clearly older. The LSR is the local standard of rest, which you'll see is kind of in the middle here. The local standard of rest, which is the local circular velocity, that is to say the velocity that you would have if you were just in a circular orbit about the galaxy at the sun's distance from the center of the galaxy, seems to me to be mostly a mathematical sort of average or convenience it's not a velocity of anything there's no there's no tendency for things to group there um and in the heart and this is the x y velocities if you would the plane velocities if you look at the outer plane velocity it's pretty similar for the pleiades and reasonably similar reasonably you know, the, the Wolf 630 stream is split into two, and so I'd like to have more data on that. But So I really do feel like you're going to find that, that there's a heavy connection between these ISOs and galactic streams, and that's because these ISOs are almost certainly being generated by processes connected to either the birth or death of stars, and that's going to happen in these galactic streams. Um, and I also think that might help some in finding new ones. Um, Wei Quan Zi, the guy at the Ziki Transient uh, Faculty Facility, um, asked me, well, why are these things coming from the Northern Hemisphere? And it's like, well, I mean, here are the streams. They are, for whatever reason, coming from the Northern Hemisphere, which is not really an answer. So I started looking at galactic dynamics. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close, except for my conclusion here, on this one here. This is the galaxy sort of writ large. Here's the sun. The galactic center is down here at zero, zero. And here's the galactic bar. This is about real scale. This is about as good as the current models. There's, there's different models, and so it kind of is tilted back and forth, maybe 10 or 15 degrees. But this, I think, this is the one I think is the best. We are in the Orion Spur, which is an arm between the Sagittarius arm and the Perseus arm. <clears throat> the sun, the, the, the Milky Way is not a <clears throat> perfect spiral. The spiral arms of the Milky Way do not travel, they can't be traced very well over like a whole term. Um, so, but sort of around the sun, this is the structure we have. There's three arms. The sun's a little bit uh, uh, centerwards of one of them, and there are these other two. It really looks like um, Wamehameha is objects from the Sagittarius arm, a stream coming up, and is about at Apelion now, not or Apple Apps rather, uh, <clears throat> maximum distance from the galactic center. <clears throat> Whereas Borisov and the Wolf 630 stream 
were from the Perseus arm, effectively. They were much further out and are now coming in at a fairly high rate of speed on a very on a reasonably elliptical orbit. And in fact, it looks like they might go all the way down to just this region near the galactic bar. And it seems like all this structure is driven by the galactic bar. The galactic bar makes the local, you know, the galactic bar is rotating, if I remember correctly, faster than the rotation of the stars. And so you could sort of think of it like a blender where you have this arm down here rotating around and it's perturbing through gravity now, not through fluid dynamics, but it's perturbing the motions of the stars out where we are. And from that, you're getting these streams. And so one of the things that really fascinating about me about this is if we can sample these ISOs, we're gonna be sampling pieces of the galaxy that are not near us. I mean, the Perseus arm, you know, that's, um, that's like two kiloparsecs away. That's 6,000 light years. You know, that'll be a long time before we ever send a spacecraft out that far, you know, maybe 10,000 years or more, um, if we ever do. Potentially, we could get samples of it right now by just going to Borisov, assuming that this model is correct. And this model might not be correct in detail, but I think something like this is going on in reality, uh, you know, with, uh, with, with the galaxy, that we're going to be sampling pieces of the galaxy. And this is called galactic archaeology. We can sort of unpack the history of the galaxy by looking at where things are now, just like you might unpack the history of Egypt by digging up you know, uh, statues or whatever from the, from the Nile. Um, and so that to me makes this very, very relevant to exoplanet studies. And in fact, in a way, the exoplanet studies in this really, I think are gonna become very tightly coupled if we do this right. So I'm gonna just leave this up here and open this up for discussion. Um, I asked to leave 15 minutes and I think that's what I'm doing. Uh, so we now have known objects going through the solar system. We find, expect to find more with the eight meter Rubin Observatory Telescope and the LSST camera for it, which is about the size of a, of a mini bus. Um, uh, we expect to find a lot more. Now, maybe we will, maybe we won't, but you know, if we do, then samples to them will become much more attractive. Um, I, I'm still a little nervous about it because you know, we just have two samples and I think one of them, the comet Borisov is, not really relevant for this. And so I'm still wondering, why aren't we seeing more one eye top objects? But you know, we'll see. But even if that's all we have, even if the two, we, all we have, it's still for a long time to come, they're going to be easier to get to than any real exoplanet. Going to Alpha Centauri or Proxima Centauri, anything like that, that's really hard. These are much easier. So however we get to Alpha Centauri, I think it will be applied to these first, if we don't do it you know, prior to that by some means. So I've been really glad to be able to work with the guys that I've I4IS on this, and I uh, hope, you know, I hope we can make some things happen in the future. So thank you. Um, hope oh, that was. Okay, Marshall, thank, thank you very much for that. Uh, very interesting. I've got uh, a few thoughts running around my head to, to quiz you about, but um, maybe I can open it to the floor first to see if any of the, the listeners have questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask a question, or I see something's just arrived in the Zoom group chat as well if you'd like to consider that at all uh marshall oh i haven't been watching the chat let me see how do i pull that it's up? only just started so if you can open the chat then it's john davis is as uh hi, as asked. hi all right would it be okay if i stop sharing yeah stop sharing please we can have some uh, i think that's part of why i'm not seeing there we go that's okay. why i wasn't seeing the chat all right how weird is one eye structurally? I have no clue, and I don't think anybody else does either. I mean, I, I kind of regard, you know, there's been, there's been suggestions that one eye has a very low um, uh, drag coefficient. And in fact, I wrote a paper about the implications of that, because if it has a low drag coefficient, it, if it's very subject to drag, it, you know, it could be subject to drag in the galaxy. The drag in the galaxy is less than the drag in the solar system, but on the, or the radiation pressure in the solar system, but it's got billions of years versus, you know, a few months. And so to me, we will not, we will never untack on, we will never figure that out if we don't go. It's just mm -hmm. that simple. Um, yeah. 
we can speculate all we want. We can have, you know, more theories or whatever, but none of that will ever convince anybody until you actually go there. We just don't have the data. Um, whereas conversely, one eye, two eye seems a lot more normal. Well, in some ways, I mean, I think it has some peculiarities, but it's, it's clearly, <coughs> it's not, you know, it's not an, it's not an alien spacecraft that just happened to wander through <laughs> solar sail or anything like that it's just a comet now it may be different in some ways i think it is but you know i wrote a paper predicting that it that it was different and why i think it was different and so far i think that's my predictions have been reasonably holding up but i really want to find the time in the next six months or whatever to look at the data that's been because i did this before it went through perihelion and so now that it's gone through, we've got the data we're going to get, I want to look at all that data and say, well, does that, you know, how does that jibe with my predictions? You know, mm -hmm. it's going to fit or not. So Andreas asked, would I expect ISOs from other parts of the galaxy as well? Yes. Basically, picture we're coming up with here, and it's, this is not me, this is, you know, a whole bunch of people. The galaxy is pretty well mixed. And so even though we're not moving very fast, the sun is moving about 30 kilometers a second. Um, but still, that's 10 to the minus 4 C. And so in a billion years, which is 10 to the 9th C, you know, that's a relative motion of uh, 100 of 100,000 light years, which is the size of the galaxy. So in a billion years, you could, I think it's reasonable to expect that the, the, um, uh, the, the stars move around a lot. It's, so it's not like the solar system that way. In the solar system, you know, well, the asteroids move around somewhat, but the Earth has been here one AU from the sun, more or less, for four billion years. I mean, we were never out near Pluto, and we were never out down near Mercury. We've always been more or less here. Um, but in the solar, in the galaxy, I think it's not like that. It's more like you know, coffee in your you know, cream in your coffee or tea. You know, you put some cream in, you stir it up a little bit, little blobs can move in and out and stuff and the tea still looks more or less the same right it's still got the swat spiral in it but the actual little things in it are moving around and that's i think a better analogy for the galaxy so yes i think we will find stuff from all over um <clears throat> and one of the things i'll just mention this here one of the things that impressed me that i think a lot of people don't realize is in the solar system we see the remnants of the formation of the solar system, of the formation of a planetary system. And so we see things that were present at the time of the formation of it that have been survived till now or have left remnants till now. We don't see anything from the death of stars here because it's, you know, the sun, thank God, has never died. But in the galaxy, you're going to have objects that form both at the birth of systems and at the death of systems. For example, uh, supernovas, when they, when they supernova, you know, explodes, it ex sends out all this gas. Some of that gas then condenses. Well, does that gas then condense and form planetesimals? Don't know, but I would be surprised if it didn't. If you just look at the Crab Nebula in high resolution, it looks like it's got lots of little knots in it. Planetary nebula, same thing. If you look at them, they're there are gas and dust from dying stars that form knots. Well, those knots sure do look like they're condensing to me. And so these things could be quite prevalent. The, the, the sort of the, 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 the remnants of the death of stars as well as the remnants of the birth of stars. And so we'll find both of these in interstellar objects. So we could well find stuff that is totally new to us, not even, not even counting on interstellar, on, uh, you know, um, interstellar uh, spacecraft coming through. Hmm. So, any other questions? So, Marshall, you talked about uh, these loitering type missions. Where would these spacecraft be loitering? Then, is that some Lagrange point well, or something? Or my or, original idea was that you would have something that was just ready to go. You know, you'd build a spacecraft, you'd have it ready to go, you'd put it in a warehouse or something, and you just, you know, you got you got a year to launch it. Okay, so I can now, store. Talking to people. I don't think that's as realistic as I thought it was. Um, you know, the, the, the notion that you're going to pull out a five-year-old spacecraft and sort of resurrect whatever team was used to, you know, to, to design it and test it and whatnot, 
and then put it on a rocket that you're now going to buy with, with what money and so on. It just, there's a bunch of ways that, you know, from talking to people about this, I don't think it's as realistic as I thought. It's a military way, right? You could have an ICBM in a, in a silo somewhere and convert it to one of these things and just have it ready to go. But short of that, so unless it's, unless it really is an alien spacecraft, I don't think we're going to do that. And people have proposed loitering missions, which are, you send it out to, well, where would you send it to? Well, um, the earth moon uh, Lagrange points, the earth sun Lagrange points, both of those are attractive. A distant retrograde lunar orbit is also attractive. Just somewhere where it's not going to wander away too far, too fast. Um, and where you can get to objects that fly by. Um, yeah, well, there, there's, there's the uh, uh, ESA uh, comet interceptor, which is Lagrange 2. Yes. Um, and I'm sure they're hoping to get an interstellar object. Mm. Officially, oh, it's just uh, for... Yeah, I, I, I've heard Garayan Thames, who's the, who's the prop in charge at UCL, uh, the, he explicitly said that in his inaugural lecture a couple of years ago, that he was looking for interstellar objects as well. Yeah. I mean, if they have to, they can go to... I mean, the trouble is, if, I mean, I mentioned, I talked to people, one of the things I've realized is, what is it, why does a spacecraft cost money? A spacecraft costs money because you have a team of people that are running it. Hmm. And so if you delay a spacecraft by a year, you keep that team employed, you know? So if you delay it by five years, you keep that team employed. And it's, cause it's not like you can just let them all go and hire them back. It's not mm. like a, a restaurant or something. I mean, restaurants around here have been letting their staff go because they don't have any work because of COVID. Well, you know, they can hire chefs back and if they can't get the same chef, they can get a different chef, but it's not really like that with spacecraft. Mm. And uh, not with this kind of spacecraft work, at least. Well, ESA and must have a plan for that, I guess. I'm sorry? ESA must have a plan for that. I mean, uh, the, 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 the Comet Interceptor is going is to go there and loiter. I don't know how long they plan it to loiter, but uh, probably a few years, I would guess. Um, they must well, have a plan. Well, historically, there's been one or two new comets a year. Right. Exactly. Right. Not counting the ones that Soho detects, the Kreutzer comets, I think they're called. Right. Those are different because those fall right into the sun and they're kind of small and whatnot. But the actual new comets that are like, you know, blazed forth in the heavens, the Kahootek types, there's a few of those a year typically. So, you know. Okay. So maybe they won't have long to wait. I'm sorry? They won't have long to wait. I don't think so. For those interstellar objects, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's realistic to say you're going to wait for Borisov. I just don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Um, I mean, I, I may be more negative than most people, but it's, the math is not that complicated. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, you know, I mean, I said into the 70s. Well, let's say you said into <clears throat> the 90s. Well, that's still 25 years. So... You know, and I don't think anybody thinks you wouldn't have found that something like this by the late 90s. So, you know, uh, unless there's something we're missing here. Well, and there's the issue of the, of the low velocity stuff, too. Um, there's so one candidate that has a velocity of infinity of, I believe, six kilometers a second. It seems reasonable. And then a bunch of candidates that have velocities of one or so kilometers a second or less that all have issues. They all have, you know, outgassing or something, you know, uh, observational problems in some cases, you know, because, I mean, a lot depends on like, well, when, you know, when did the thing come close to this, you know, what was the relationship between the earth and the sun when the thing came from the solar system? You know, was it like, did you get a good view or was the sun in the way or, or whatever? And so some of them have those kind of observational issues. Uh, but we should be seeing a lot of one eyes. It's been three years. I mean, the observational estimate of 0.2 one eyes per AU cubed is based on the notion that we were observing for three with uh, pan stars for three years. Well, we've been another three years. Yeah. 
So why haven't we seen another one? You know, the longer um, it takes before another one turns up, like One Eye, um, the the more urgent it is to actually do the rendezvous with it, or at least get get some sort of observation of it close up. Yes. Well, and there's another thing. You know, I was thinking. One Eye had all these weird aspects to it. What if we find a whole bunch of these guys and they all seem kind of normal? And then mm. One Eye will be, you know, odd. You mean lots of Boris arms? No, I meant One Eyes. Right. I mean, the, the whole thing about the, the, the trouble is we just didn't have a lot of good data. We don't, ha we don't have really a long enough series of data to really be sure about this, but it really did look like one eye was having a, you know, unexplained acceleration. What was it causing that? And was that really radiation pressure? Was that really outgassing of some sort? If it was outgassing, outgassing of what? Um, Cause it didn't detect any, we didn't detect any outgassing and Spitzer, towards the end of the observation period, Spitzer, the Spitzer Space Telescope, sat on one eye for a fairly long time looking for carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, I forget which, but it should have found it if it was there. Mm. Ah, are people looking on old sky surveys or previous interstellar objects? Well, that's a very good question. I suspect that for individual surveys, like the ones where they realized, you know, we our software really wasn't. I, I suspect they've reanalyzed because they typically stay, save all the data, so they can just reanalyze stuff. Um, it would be very interesting to go through, for example, the, the whole the, the so-called Harvard Sky Patrol. Har Harvard University used to take pictures of the whole sky on a regular basis going back to eight, well, the whole sky they could see from there, you know, from Cambridge, uh, so the northern sky, going back to 1895. And that's been used for all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, it, it only goes down to about 13th or 14th magnitude, I think, but <clears throat> uh, for example, the 3C273, the quasar, has oh. brightness data going back to 1895. The the first centaur that was discovered, um, Chiron, Chiron, um, has data going back to 1890s, um, astrometric data, which really helps with its orbit. Um, <coughs> so, at some point, somebody should probably figure out some way of going through all this old data and seeing what they, you know, seeing if there's other stuff there. But on the other hand, I mean, if I found in 1950, say the say the Palomar spot, the Palomar Sky Survey. If I found an interstellar object in that, it's long past the solar system. So what do I do with that? I mean, besides just you know, oh yeah, I found one. You know, I can get it in my name on it or whatever. Uh, you know, it's like I don't think we're going to send a mission to something that was found 50 years ago that we only have a really crude orbit for. No, absolutely. Marshall, I was, I was just wondering whether maybe if they did that on a sort of survey basis, maybe they could get better statistics on how many of these things there are. Well, I mean, there's been, I mean, the whole sky is surveyed now basically every few days. So, and with pretty good systems going to like 22nd magnitude or so. Um, LSST is supposed to go to 25th magnitude, I think, um, which is why a lot of the Zwicky Sky Zwicky Transient Facility, which is the old Schmidt camera at uh, Palomar, um, that's almost as good, and it it goes 23rd magnitude or something, and it, it's in the northern hemisphere. Uh, I mean, this is all paid for by you know near Earth objects and planetary protection and so on, but. It's the same, it's the same sky. And also, well, and the other thing that pays for it is particle physics, because they're looking for uh, supernova, because they want to get the uh, better determination of the, of the cosmological constant. So there's the so-called dark energy surveys, 
and that's really about the cosmological constant, which is really about supernova. But you're looking for transient stuff, and so you're looking for a supernova flaring in the galaxy, or you're looking for a, a, a dot going by. And, uh, you know, in fact, the, the LSST, I, I don't know if people, I mean, that you should get somebody to talk about that, actually, because that is a f fascinating thing. They're going to be collecting, I think it's 10 terabytes a night of data. Yeah. And that means that it's really not going to be, it's going to be the software more than anything. You know, what, you know, nobody is going to look at all that data. It's going to be, how do you have a, um, a, uh, uh, you know, how do you sift through it to find things that are interesting? And I'm sure that you're going to have people now who like, you know, they write PhD thesis. Well, I took all this old data and I figured out a new way to look for whatever. And um, so somebody asked on the chat, what tools do we use to, uh, to find the Jupiter solar or Earth Saturn trajectory to Waimeamea? Uh, basically, there's two ways of doing that. Adam Hibbert tends to do sort of what you might be regard as more correct way, which is he sets up Monte Carlo type things and runs lots and lots and lots of different solutions and sees which one work. Um, I was just, well, I looked at the, you know, I looked at the, uh, the, the, the solar system. I knew where Waimeamea was going. I knew where Jupiter was. I knew where Saturn was. I knew where Neptune was because you could actually kind of do the same thing with Neptune. Uh, it's not quite as efficient, but it would work. Um, and I was just like, okay, what do I have to do to get the spacecraft from Jupiter to the sun to Saturn at the right time with the right velocity? And, you know, so I was kind of doing the forward problem rather than the inverse problem. Like, you know, I know what I want to do. How do I do it? As opposed to, well, I'm going to try lots of things and see which ones are the best ones to do. And, um, but I got to tell you, Adam's been doing really great things like with deep space maneuvers and so on. Um, it, it's, you know, a lot of this stuff is not intuitive in the sense of like, well, it might be better just to go out into deep space and then do a burn. Right? Well, why is that? Well, it depends on, you know, like, for example, if you're trying to lower the total delta V. And so if you go out and go away from the sun, that can take less to get close to the sun. So that you can then use the velocity you save to do a bigger Oberth burn near the sun, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. And I mean, there's a real difference between now and the 60s. In the 60s, a lot of this was done analytically. And people thought about, you know, okay, well, what's a, the Holman trajectory and how do I minimize the transfer between here and there and so on? And, and now a lot of it's more numerical driven where it's like, well, you know, I've got so much Delta V, how do I get to where I'm going, you know, with the minimum amount of it? Um, uh, is there a plausible way to get to y one eye at a later date? Yes. Basically, you can go almost any time you want. The question you have to ask is, how much money do you have? How much Delta V do you have? And how long are you willing to wait? So um, it's moving away at about six AU per year. So every year you wait, it's another 60 AU further away. So, you know, if you wait another 10 years, that's 60 AU. And so if you're, if you're catching up with it at 6 AU per year, which is a reasonable number, um, i.e. twice the velocity, then that's another, you know, 10 years. So basically that's what you find is if, if you, you know, with a relatively limited system where you just can't spend infinite Delta V or infinite money, then the longer you wait, you're, you're, you're increasing not just the time that you wait. In other words, it's not just, oh, I'm going to wait from 2030, 2020 to 2030. That's another 10 years. Okay. It's like, it's going to take another 10 years because I waited. Um, that's a rule of thumb, but, you know. So if you wait to 2035, you know, it's probably going to be 2060 or so before you get there. 
Um, is, some of all that, um, is some of all that in the, in the papers that you've written, uh, Marshall, with Andreas and Adam, some of those details? <laughs> some of this is and some of this isn't. Okay. <clears throat> the... The whole thing about the, uh, the the capture or netting efficiency is is never, I mean, that's not very sophisticated math. It's been discussed by other people for other other situations, but you know we've never put that into press. Most of this capture stuff has appeared in a whole bunch of papers. We're working on another paper that table and that image of delta v's versus time. Um, that's for a paper that we're writing on right now. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's been slowed somewhat because we also wrote a Venus balloon paper on astrobiology, um, and that was pretty interesting. And um, uh, but that paper has now been accepted, and we're going through the final proof right this weekend, or right this week rather. And so, uh, is there a point of a manned mission to an ISO? Well, I would say that depends on what you got there, right? Um, it's an awful long way away. Um, you know, really, if it's, not a, if it's not an alien spaceship or something like that, I don't see what the point of sending people to it would be. I, I, uh, was, I was being a bit fanciful, Marshall, but um, it's just that I, I uh, got, if I'm Mercier, uh, one of our brilliant artists, to do a, a cover for the uh, uh, February 2018 issue of Principium that imagined a, an astronaut on uh, bouncing off a moon and and at the closest approach to the to the Earth Moon system and and there they are in the distance. Um, I'm told that it's geometrically accurate, but uh, it was fanciful. But, uh, well, you know, if you calculate, Mike, how much stuff have we put into into deep space? Well. We've got five or six spacecraft. We've got their upper stages, and so there's another five or six, you know, things out there that are basically big tanks, big, big empty tanks of stuff. Um, you know, that's not a lot. But if you if you imagine, like, I don't know if you ever seen the Expanse, the, the video read show. The mm -hmm. You read the books. Well, when you read the books, just think about. All this stuff, like those Gauss rounds they keep firing off and all that kind of stuff, that's all going to infinity. I'm not kidding. That's all, you know, in, this, in the story, they don't talk about it, but it's all going out. It's all going to go at escape velocity. So it's all going to escape from the solar system. So it's all out there somewhere for somebody to find a billion years later. You know, so from that standpoint, if you start thinking about what people might be doing, like, for example, if you were building a uh, Dyson cloud, around the star how much stuff might you lose right so the chances of finding something like that now probably not large but you know chances of finding something falling through the solar system if things like that are going on out in the galaxy doesn't sound that impossible um and so but yeah i mean to me it's like it's it's gotta have something like that to make it worth I mean, the reason you send people are because either you think that that's a place where people might live, or you think there's something that, there that's so important that people need to be sent to deal with it. And I don't know what else would be that important. And clearly, you're not going to live on these tiny guys, right? It would make more sense to go to, you know, Ganymede or something and live there. Um, and we're not going to do that anytime soon either. Uh, but... Uh, um, uh, I was you know, starting to get the feeling something was not what it seemed to be. If you found that something was really like a like a solar sail or something, you'd probably want to send people out there at some point. Might want to bring it back. Mm. I was thinking, Marshall, that I think this uh, conversation could quite easily go on and on and. Uh, um, well, I have an yeah. advantage of you. It's only four o'clock here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in, in in interest of uh, keeping everyone uh, going, at future presentations and there, maybe we should uh, curtail the conversation just a little. I understand. Bit. I think if, I, I um, very much enjoyed this. I don't know if you're 
You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Marshall, for your talk. I don't know if your email address was on the slides that you put up or if anyone might want to send you a question or anything like that. Um, I could post it in the chat if you wanted me to. Uh, just in case anyone online at the you moment... You know how to get to me. So. We, we do. There's a few other guests that I, I, I'm not familiar with who are watching at the moment, so maybe they'll, uh, they'll be interested to catch up with you or quiz you on any questions. Especially when John starts talk, asking fanciful questions, I think it's time to uh, to move on. But uh, I really pre really appreciate you doing the first, what is our very first open presentation online for I4S, I think, really. And um, but it's a new a new thing for us, so uh, it looks like it's going to be a success this, this first round, and there's going to be some more after Christmas. Um, but thank you very much for your time and just talking through some of those things, which I've I've missed a lot of, even though I've seen it going on in the background. So it's great to to hear it direct from yourselves and.